This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Silent Voices. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. I'm your host, Dennis Lawrence. Next to me from B Swan is Dina Kostra. And we got quite a show today, jam packed, uh, and I like to really get started. But first of all, we're going to kick it off with Baby LK News. Take it away, Baby LK. Our top story this week. In Kansas, a sperm donor is ordered to pay child support after the lesbian mother goes on welfare, which he's trying to fight in court. After the state threatens to sue him for non-payment, and a lower court judge said he had to pay. Paranoid U.S. parents are now buying up bulletproof clothing for their kids in light of the Newtown, Connecticut school shooting a couple weeks back. And in Florida, the child protective industry is trying to shut down a group home that they didn't license. In Illinois, the state senate rejects extra funding for road projects in the Department of Children and Family Services after promising the money to horse tracks instead. In Michigan, the child protective industry is being accused of failing to protect a little girl who was stabbed to death by her mother by failing to snatch her when they had the chance. In Georgia, an audit finds that the state's child protective industry's computer system, which costed $50 million to set up and $14 million a year to run as a way of keeping track of abused and neglected children, contains outdated information, and that Georgia's CPS agents are failing to file reports of suspected child abuse into the system in a time manner anyway. In Maine, teachers are claiming to be confused in regards to the new rules around the use of dangerous and abusive physical restraints of unruly students. Maine's CPS loving governor wants to toughen the state's child abuse reporting laws, and two adoptive parents of a Russian orphan in Maine are upset over Russia's new adoption ban. In Massachusetts, a bill is submitted that would create a safety plan for social workers who piss people off. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear the case of a Native American girl who was adopted by a white family in 2009 when the mother gave her up, then ordered back to her real father when he protested. In North Carolina, the head of the child protective industry calls DHHS structurally broken and says that it's lucky that they can accomplish anything with the level of dysfunction that they are facing. In Ohio, a debate is raging on regarding the forcing of parents to pay child support for the kids who are stolen by CPS agents, regardless of the fact that it makes it very difficult for them to get their kids back. And in Tennessee, the child protective industry is being accused of mishandling child abuse cases by a group of experts tasked with examining the worst cases in the state. The U.S. Congress passes a foster care education bill that would give CPS agents access to the student records of foster children, taking away a parent's rights to protect their kids' school records. The U.S. Senate passes a bill expressing disappointment over the new Russian adoption ban, and Speaker of the House John Boner tells the U.S. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid to go fuck himself outside the Oval Office. In China this week, ten kids who survived a fire at the orphanage they were living in are now being cared for by the government. North Korea approves the adoption of their kids to American parents where they will likely be abused like the Russian kids. And in South Africa, the child protective industry is failing to put sex offenders on the child protection register in a timely manner. In Australia, a lobby group is accusing the government of using privacy laws to cover for pedophiles. In Canada, the Ottawa Youth Services Bureau is trying to address the problem of young homeless people, most of whom came out of their foster care system. In Manitoba, where the inquiry into the death of a little girl who was involved with the child welfare system plugs away, the system is still found to be in utter chaos where they just can't seem to get it right. In England, a former foster kid is due to be sentenced for ripping off his foster mother of 10 years after he had lost his job. And 8,000 British social 
workers have been barred from practicing after failing to renew their licensing registration with the Health and Care Professional Council. In entertainment news this week, MTV's teen mom, Janelle Evans, husband of less than one month, claims that he is dumping her after she threatened him with a false abuse claim. In Illinois, a former foster parent pleads guilty to sexually abusing a little boy that he knew. In Oklahoma, a foster father is arrested for sending sexual text messages to a 15-year-old former foster daughter. In North Carolina, a teenager is charged with trying to stab a staff member at her group home. And in Georgia, a warrant is issued for a foster mother who beat her two kids, including a foster child in her care with a belt. In Arizona, two boys are recaptured after trying to escape from the group home that CPS had put them in. In California, the Sacramento County Child Protective Industry is being criticized for inadequately reviewing the case of a CPS agent who abused kids herself. A panel of California appellate judges ruled in favor of a U.S. Marine who had lost custody of his kid to his ex-wife because he had been deployed to Afghanistan. And in Florida, a father is pissed after CPS agents investigate him, including visiting his kids at school after it was reported that he had exercised his Second Amendment rights by owning and safely firing guns. In Illinois, a father who has custody of the kids is owed more than $30,000 in back child support, which he hasn't been paid. In Missouri, a former teacher who had her child abuse charges dropped is suing the child protective industry so that she can try to get her job back. In New York, a family court judge is censured for misconduct after visiting a girl in the psychiatric psychiatric ward and treating lawyers and a probation supervisor rudely. In Utah, a judge upholds a decision to give a father custody of his child after the mother tried to adopt the kid out from under him. And finally tonight, in Minnesota, a couple's foster care license is revoked amid concerns about the foster father getting drunk and firing his gun out the back door. For these stories and all the latest dirt on the child protective industry, visit www.legallykidnapped.com. And until next week, this is Baby LK, over and out. Are the Garcias in? Yeah, they're right in the front row. How could I miss you? <laughs> I think I'd like to take you next. Uh, the Garcias lost a grandchild, and they have been working and working and working. We've gone together to uh, state legislature and talked with, uh, who was that, majority leader there uh, with his aide. And, uh, and, and they've been trying, and they have a pretty good set, pretty good collection of uh, evidence that shows that the things the, the 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 allegations upon which decisions were made are different from the facts that come out later. So, Jose and Margaret Garcia, come on up. Hi, I'm Margaret Garcia. I'm Jose Garcia. And back in 2004, our son Micah and his wife Ophelia, they were in the process of adopting Ophelia's six-year-old first cousin because the mother had been on drugs 
and the father asked my son and his wife if they would take Alyssa and to keep her in the family. So they went through the process and they made them go through the foster care system first that they had to go through all the requirements for foster care licensing and then they got Alyssa and then one day um, my son was giving his son Joshua who was three year old a uh, bath and at the end of the bath he urinated in the tub and so my son took Joshua out and he ran a little bit of hot water in the tub and he was going to come back later and sanitize the tub before he fixed Alyssa's bath water and while he was taking care of Joshua Alyssa mistakenly got into the tub with a little bit of hot water so she burned like the back of her legs and so when she screamed Ophelia came came into the bathroom and took her out and the back of her legs was just red so they had a shower in the basement so they gave her a cool shower and the back of her legs were just a little bit red but she wasn't in pain anymore so they thought well she'll be okay and then that next morning she had her breakfast and when she got up and walked away from the table they noticed that the back of her pajama pants was wet so they checked why her pants was wet and they discovered that she now had had developed blisters on the back of her leg so she still didn't have any pain but now she had blisters so her condition had changed so they took her to the hospital for help but instead of getting help they were falsely accused of breaking Alyssa's bones and having bruises all over her back and they called Alyssa and the parents liars because they said no she just got into a tub with a little bit of hot water that wasn't her bath water and so they called them all liars and the one ER doctor Don Clark called CPS and they made this false report about her burns and the broken bones which she didn't have and um, bruises all over her back which she didn't have so there's all these false allegations and so that same day they took Alyssa and they transferred her over to Blodgett Hospital from Metro and they took Joshua and we haven't seen the children since that day they wouldn't let us see the children they wouldn't let the parents see the children and this is something that they do is they they won't let the children see the parents or the family members so then they can tell you later the children don't remember you anymore and so my son they tried to put some kind of um, criminal charges for child abuse on him but they they dropped all those charges and they passed lie detector tests and they had to go through all kinds of requirements for drug testing and all kind of things which they passed everything but they still didn't get the children back so pretty quickly they uh, put Alyssa into a different foster care home where she was adopted into that home and the foster care home that Joshua was put in they also adopted him in there but we also tried to get Joshua um, and in the adoption report um, it falsely states from uh, Bethany that the parents had poured boiling water all over Alyssa's hands and burned her hands all up and this was a new lie because nobody had ever said this before that the parents 
poured boiling water all over Alyssa's hands and burned her hands all up. So this was another new lie that was in the adoption denial report for us because we tried to adopt Alyssa. And so this is a copy of the, um, the burn survey. And here it shows where she had the burns from the back of her legs from the hot water in the tub. But over here for the hands, there's nothing. She didn't have any burns on her hands. And then in another report, it says that she has, Alyssa has no broken bones. So that was another lie, them saying that she had broken bones. And then another part of this report shows that she never had a broken bone. So she didn't have any broken bones and she has never had a broken bone. And then another report, the total body burn survey showed that there's no broken bones, no organ injuries, nothing. All she had was the accidental burn on the back of her legs, but all the broken bones, that's a lie. And, uh, and also about the bruises on the back, that was a lie too. Now in another ER doctor's report, which was hidden from us, and they hid all this from us, which of course is against the law. It says that the patient had no battle signs, so that this was not child abuse, this was just an accident. And children do have accidents. And then they also hit, hit another doctor's report that shows there's no injuries on Alyssa's back. So that proves she doesn't have bruises all over her back. That was another one of the lies. And then in one of the court cases, um, prosecutor Laura Clifton lied and said that Alyssa had bruising all over her back in different stages of healing. And she said that the doctor was so concerned she ordered a body scan and found more injuries on Alyssa. And that was a total lie from prosecutor Laura Clifton. And then in another part of the case, Judge Carpenter said that she could not find by any clear and convincing evidence that there's a reasonable likelihood that Joshua will be harmed if returned to his parents once they have had a meaningful opportunity to demonstrate their capacity to parent. So there was no evidence that the parents hurt the children. And in another part, Judge Carpenter also said that no evidence was produced at trial that the respondents, which means the parents, had injured Joshua at any time. Further, no evidence was produced that the respondents had previously inflicted similar injuries on Alyssa. Respondents expressed regret for injuries suffered by Alyssa and a willingness to learn parenting skills to assure the well-being of Joshua in their care. And then she terminated parental rights for Joshua. After saying all of that, she terminated the parental rights. So my son and his wife and my husband and I, we have been pursuing trying to get the children back. But in the court, you can't win when the court is corrupt. And another thing about um, our case, it was in Kent County Family Court. Prosecutor Laura Clifton and Judge Carpenter, they're both former employees of Bethany Christian Services. So it's very easy for them to lie against innocent parents and steal the children so they can just get more government funding for putting these children in foster care and putting them up for adoption. They can get up to $175 a day for each child in foster care 
and then when they put the child up for adoption they can get up to eight thousand dollars for each adoption for a child so they make a lot of money stealing these children from innocent parents and nobody makes any money when they just keep the children with the parents they don't make any money so that's a big difference there that tells you why they're doing this they're doing this for the money because there's no money when the children stay with their parents and the parents take care of their children so we've been through um, the Kent County Court for the section 45 case we've been to the appeals court we've been to Michigan Supreme Court and we've been to the United States um, Supreme Supreme Court and we were denied there too so we've been to all those courts and they still won't give the children back but uh, even though we've also been fighting to get Joshua back eventually we want him back with his parents because that's where he belongs is back with his parents and the foster family that has Alyssa they have turned her against her family so Alyssa she doesn't even want to see her own sisters anymore because in a lot of cases the foster families will turn the children against their biological families so they don't want to even have anything to do with their own family anymore so but this is why we've been fighting for eight years and this is why we've been working with the government trying to let them know what is happening to our families and this is a violation of the fifth and fourteenth amendments of due process because they completely lied on everything they have done with our cases and they've gotten away with it and this is a big problem of there's a great prejudice against lay people because if a doctor says something people just automatically believe the doctor or if a social worker says something they automatically believe the social worker and in many cases it's the social workers and the doctors they're the ones who are lying and in our case the prosecutor and the judges and everything they're the ones who are lying to steal these children from innocent families so we but we still keep working and that's the very important thing is don't do nothing you have to keep working and you have to keep fighting to change things because if we do nothing then the people who lie and frame innocent families and steal the children they just keep getting away with destroying innocent families thank you um, we've heard a couple of things uh, in common already one is uh, uh, false allegations um, and that comes up over and over uh, another thing we've already seen from two speakers is if the child stays in foster care for a certain length of time well then they assume there's a bond there or uh, and, and you, you know you can't put the child back in his with his biological parents because uh, you know that would be another change another shock well so we have some legislation some legislative goals uh, one we we don't think that uh, uh, children should be prevented from uh, being reunified with their parents simply based on time away from the parents if the parents are innocent okay um, another one of our goals is that uh, uh, children should be placed with relatives now we did several of us went down and t testified on that on a bill uh, near the end of 2010 and then we did get that bill passed it's not quite strong enough but at least it improved the law a little bit uh, we've heard uh, of uh, on the false allegations one of the reasons that that uh, social workers can get away with that is because they're not subject to a, a civil lawsuit uh, for doing that and so uh, long ago we we introduced legislation uh, my rep Fulton Sheen 
uh, wrote it and uh, introduced it several years ago. Well, now that's been reintroduced uh, by Representative Tom McMillan, and maybe we'll see some action on it. The wording is exactly the same. He just reintroduced it. There was, on the other hand, uh, legislation by a couple of reps to extend, to enlarge the immunity uh, from civil suit to private agencies. And so what we did is went down and talked to them. We gave them uh, substitute wording. Uh, we gave them amended wording. And then we gave that language to, the, to Rep. McMillan, who wrote the, uh, the bill that w would have removed immunity. So we're working on the immunity thing. And I don't like uh, lawsuits. Um, you know, there's the, a, a friend of mine was a state rep. He said he's been doing some research on lawyer jokes. He said there's only three lawyer jokes. The rest of them are all true stories. You know, lawyers are not fun to work with. They're expensive to work with. And too many people in the room already know how expensive they are. But uh, sometimes a civil lawsuit is the only way to reach justice. So uh, if, if you are uh, open to a lawsuit, you're going to be very careful about what you say and do. And that's what we think uh, ought to happen. Hello, I'm a child protective worker. Uh, we have Citizens for Parental Rights meetings held every month the third Monday of the month from 7 to 9 p.m. at the studios, uh, 5261 Clyde Park Avenue, Wyoming, Michigan. Come on out and join us to reform Thank you this. for watching this week. Remember, we have an email ad address for comments, suggestions, and that is at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network which you can visit, and that's at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Until next week, remember, your voice can make the difference.